section of the National Football League. The NFL is online at NFL.com. For more, log on to ESPN.com. Fowler for Sports Century. In the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, America had eight presidents. Baseball had six commissioners, and the NBA had four. But in all that time, the National Football League was run by only one man. Pete Rozelle rose from a summer gopher to become the most influential person in sports, presiding over a monopolistic empire that used the principles of socialism and opened up the spigot on TV money. right after the Second World War. Pro football would be best described as a third-class sport. It was behind baseball, of course, but it was also behind college football. If you were a professional football player, you were still a little suspect. It was a little tawdry. And Pete gave them class. He also gave them integrity. He probably had the greatest sense of public relations of anybody I've ever known in my life. And not only did he have the sense, he had the look. The Commissioner of Football, Mr. Pete Rozelle. Welcome. To he was very cautious about how he looked, you know, from the suit to the tie to whether he was fit and trim and tan. And I think that that sense went from home all the way into football. What is the, the image that you'd like football to have? Oh, I guess I would like it, obviously, to have uh, total integrity, uh, have the confidence of the, of the public. I like it to be exciting, modern, with it. He was the ultimate spin man. I mean, he was the, the barker. He was the champion of, of, a, of a great new phenomenon in American culture. With Roselle at the helm, the NFL struck a brave new course, its sails filled by the new winds of television. And a handoff to Snell. He may go, and he's in there. First big thing Pete Roselle did was to get all the clubs to give up their television rights, put it in one pot, and go out and sell it. With Roselle as their negotiator, NFL owners were taken to undreamed financial heights. Between 1962 and 1987, each team's slice of the annual network TV revenue rose from $326,000 to almost $17 million. It was Roselle's genius to see that if they shared those revenues, and had an all-for-one and one-for-all approach uh, that the game could not just grow, but it could explode. He could sense that this thing called the National Football League could become America's greatest watched and appreciated sport, and that the Super Bowl could be the single greatest moment in sports. Showtime, hey, baby, what you talking about? Showtime! So he made this whole thing, the Super Bowl. He built in his own mind the media show around it because he thought we could make this different than the Rose Bowl or the World Series. It starts with a whistle and ends with a gun. 60 minutes of close in action from kickoff to touchdown. This is pro football, the sport of our time. In 1965, the league approved NFL Films, a propaganda machine which portrayed the grit and violence of pro football as an art form bigger than life, even majestic. Pete saw in our films a way to create an image for the sport. The condensation in the air, seeing the breath, the battle, the operatic music. He said, we got to get this on television because this is creating a mythology for the sport. And that's what we need if we're going to pass baseball and college football. <laughs> Under Roselle's direction, the NFL provided an escape from the uncertainties of the times. Although it was just a game, it became an affirmation of American manhood, a clearly defined contest of clean-cut, upstanding heroes. Pete Roselle made the professional football players stand on the sidelines, put their helmet under their arm, and if not sing the national anthem, at least show respect for that flag. Football appeals 
very much to a socially conservative element of society, which uh, he rode for all it was worth. As a player, I was not allowed to make the decision as to whether I wanted to or not to have uh, facial hair. He was like the Gestapo of pro football. You know, you gotta go through Pete Rozelle. The players had absolutely no rights whatsoever. They were not allowed to talk about their salaries with any other player. Uh, they could be traded, cut, fired, or whatever. They could never play out the option. Pete Rozelle was the arbitrator of all grievances. He was the man. I mean, it was Pete Rozelle's league. Nobody questioned his decisions. Everybody left Pete Rozelle alone. Uh, what he said went, period. In June of 1969, Rozelle tested his authority against one of pro football's most popular players, Joe Namath, who five months earlier had predicted and delivered a Super Bowl victory. He threatened to suspend the Jets quarterback unless he sold his interest in a nightclub frequented by known gamblers. Well, I... I'm not selling. I'll quit. This is ridiculous. It is the responsibility of this office to advise individuals, both players and other club personnel, whenever any of their associations could possibly cause harm to their individual reputations or the game of professional football. After six weeks, Namath relented. Fourteen months later, Joe Willie would be the star attraction in the debut of Roselle's latest extravaganza, primetime television. In less than five, in three... Two, one, take, take. Monday Night Football really got on the air because of Pete Rozelle uh, and really not anybody else. The advertisers never thought it would work. The network didn't want it. I thought bomb out. It wasn't easy to get it adopted by the member clubs in the league. Not everybody was a visionary in the National Football League. All it's a night. The party is over. The Monday night party proved bigger than anyone expected. According to a 1972 Gallup poll, football had passed baseball as America's favorite sport. He absolutely developed the game of football the way you see it today. He was responsible for television. He was responsible for marketing. He was responsible for football becoming the number one sport in America, period. Without him, uh, pro football would have been lost in the 60s. But after two decades of prosperity, labor conflict and costly litigation splintered league solidarity, leaving Roselle atop a house divided. The 80s have not been a pleasant time for the owners, myself, or a lot of people close to football. You know, when you talk about three trials in five years, 81, 82, 86, and uh, it just seemed for a while there that they were never going to end. Fight Al Davis, fight Donald Trump, fight, you know, everywhere he looked. And I think it was very, very fatiguing for him. Unknown to the public, Roselle's health was deteriorating. His two packs a day cigarette habit grew to three packs a day, sometimes more. If he was serious, he'd light a cigarette, and in two drags, it would be gone. He'd inhale like you couldn't imagine just disappear. The ashes would get longer and longer. And I saw more and more of those uh, two drag cigarettes as the years passed. And the litigation became more intense. And the money became more and more substantial. He didn't want the NFL to know that he was having radiation on his throat. He was a very heavy smoker. And so obviously, usually when they give you radiation, you know what that's for. Well, I did know at one time that he had uh, a mini stroke. He went to New York Hospital under an assumed name. There's no doubt in my mind that his illness and problems ensued after the stress of the 80s. No question about it. Because he was on a serious, serious attack. His integrity and character was under siege. This ESPN Classic Program is brought to you by GMC.
commissioner of a sport is like herding cats. Owners are very successful, wealthy people. They are not people who are easily muzzled. They are not people who are easily told to follow majority rule. I've seen owners try to bait him, try to antagonize him, try to directly assault him. Cal Rosenblum once wanted to have him impeached as commissioner. And Cal got up at a league meeting with a long, legal-sized yellow pad and started reading a bill of particulars, what he was going to do to Roselle, get even with him, what have you. And we were thunderstruck at the vitriol and the diatribe that Carol threw out of that league meeting. He walked out, you'll never see me here again, walked out of the room, and it was dead silence, and Roselle said, time for lunch. Roselle's cool demeanor was formed in the field of public relations, first with the L.A. Rams, then as a partner in a San Francisco firm. In 1957, he returned to the Rams as general manager. After Commissioner Burt Bell's death in 1959, the 33-year-old Roselle was not even in the running when the owners met in Miami Beach to elect a new commissioner in January of 1960. And they were deadlocked, and deadlocked, and deadlocked, and deadlocked. Finally, we had exhausted, I guess, everybody on the list. And I remember so well, I turned to Dan Reeves and said, I think it's got to be Pete. So on the 23rd ballot, on the seventh day, they elected Pete Rosell commissioner. And Rosenblum of the Colts set out to find him. And he found him in the men's room, washing his hands. And the official benediction of Rosell as the new future of the NFL was Rosenblum tapping him on the shoulder and he says, Pete, you're it. It's always been my theory that he got a quick vote, yes, because everybody thought that they would be able to control him. But the control soon was Roselle's. In his first three years as commissioner, Roselle moved the NFL offices from outside Philadelphia to Manhattan, successfully lobbied Congress to allow him to negotiate the NFL's first league-wide TV contract, then acted with cool dispatch when a gambling scandal flared. Number five won't be in the backfield for Green Bay this season. Paul Horning's suspension came as a surprise to everyone in Green Bay. In April of 1963, the commissioner rocked the sports world. Green Bay halfback Paul Horning and Detroit defensive tackle Alex Karras were suspended indefinitely for gambling on NFL games. People today have uh, trouble understanding how big Horning and Karras were at the time. It was like the best defensive player and the best offensive player of that era. And suspending both of them was such a uh, huge event. I don't think he had a conscience. I don't think it was anything that he even thought about. He had to do what he had to do. It's much like the Army. He came out of, boy, as a strong commissioner. I mean, he's setting an example for the league, and he did. You know, the guys that were betting alongside of me took a second look back. I guarantee you they did. They just they scared the hell out of them. From Dallas, Texas, the Flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. He's always said that his big mistake was to have played the games on Sunday after President Kennedy's assassination. I think we were all shocked that, uh, that the game was going to go on on Sunday. It was a period of deep national mourning. It was a terrible chance for Roselle and the league to take. It could have set back football for a considerable amount of time. I thought it might. Instead, Roselle not only survived the controversy with his usual aplomb, he was crowned Sportsman of the Year by Sports Illustrated for acting decisively and independently in the interest of the NFL. He was a master of presenting himself and his position in such a way that you walked away, well, that's okay. Whether you, whether you were totally against it or not. He was a perfect example of the, the iron hand and the velvet glove. Softest part of Pete Rosella, his teeth. <laughs> We've had a slogan in the National Football League since the day I arrived. Think League. That's Roselle's 
greatest accomplishment was bringing all of these people to one idea that the league is more important than this team or that team. If the league prospers, each team will prosper. Baseball still hasn't learned that lesson. You could save up to seven. What do you have? His press conferences were a work of art. Thanks very much. <laughs> I was included in a number of friends that he'd have scattered throughout the audience, and if he wanted a question answered, he'd make sure that he'd have a designated person to ask him that question so he could answer it. Nobody laid a glove on him. No matter what the question was, no matter how difficult, how controversial, he always gave a reasoned, solid, sensible answer. But then, when it was all over, here's what it do. Here's what made Pete Rosell. Take off his jacket, take a chair, turn it around, and sit in the back of the chair, and it'll, okay, fellas, what do you want to talk about? All the people that I know from that generation who covered the National Football League are pro Pete Rosell. That's an amazing fact, because we're people that, <laughs> we're negative on a lot of things. Part of Roselle's success with the media stems from an early passion for sports journalism. Pete's ambition, actually, in high school and even through junior college, was to become the sports editor of the Los Angeles Times. It was his goal. Born in 1926, Roselle was raised in Linwood, California, a suburb of Los Angeles. A bright and popular student leader at Compton High, he was already getting his sports stories published by the local newspapers. When he was in high school, Duke Snyder was an outstanding high school player, and Pete decided that he was going to make him an all-state baseball player, and he haunted the newspaper offices of Los Angeles to tell him about Duke Snyder. We knew in junior high school that Pete Rosell was going to be something someday. He was so far above all the rest of us intellectually and loved sports so much. I remember him playing basketball and tennis. Those were his sports, not football. People ask, well, he was commissioner of the uh, National Football League. Uh, did he play football? No, he did not. <laughs> he, he was a bit frail. In a sense, the NFL came to Rosell. When the league expanded westward in 1946, the Cleveland Rams moved to Los Angeles and chose as their practice facility Compton Junior College, where Roselle was a freshman. He was probably more of a runner for them, a golfer for them, when they first came, and then they realized that this young man can write. It didn't take long for people to realize that this was there was a uniqueness in this young man, and, and it was always in a very likable way. You know, he was... He was great to be around. Fourteen years later, Roselle would be the NFL's commissioner. Persuasive, charismatic, and intelligent, he never let the power of his position cloud responsibilities to friends and employees. I had to run the national conference in the postseason, in which I had to be away Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Uh, he called my family. Christmas Eve and spoke to all my children who were five, six, seven years old and apologized for the fact that he took their father out of the house on Christmas Eve. If he was your friend, you had a great friend. Uh, if he was your enemy, you probably never knew it. Green Bay Packers. He was a king, but if he was a king, he was a benevolent uh, despot, which I guess is the, uh, the greatest form of government. At Super Bowls, Roselle schmoozed the corporate elite, league royalty, and world press. But he also found time to spend with the old gang from Compton High that gathered each year during his busiest week. Here was a guy that had everything, and the most valuable thing to him were his friends. And his friends started with his earliest childhood, and these people went with him his whole way, his whole career. He was proud of Compton. He was proud of the people he associated with. He was the same person when we were kids as he was a grown adult. He never forgot a friend. Why don't you get us something to cool this fire down? I got just the thing. For watching ESPN Classic. During his two years in the Navy at the end of World War II, Pete Rosell made his biggest discovery on a furlough in Chicago. 
up on his desk, Pete had this picture of this beautiful blonde gal. And he says, we got to go to Chicago. Girls are bigger and better in Chicago. Smitten by Jane Coop, Roselle drove to Chicago from California to court her. He moved out from Chicago, and they were, you know, at that time, you know, the two of them were very, very much in love. They married in 1949. A daughter, Anne Marie, was born at halftime of the Rams' season opener in 1958. Roselle hustled back to the Coliseum for the end of the game. Their marriage, already strained by the demands of an NFL job, came apart when they moved to New York, where Roselle's professional life consumed his days and nights. They were both perfectionist type people, and I think it was very difficult for two perfectionists, and she would create this perfect meal, and he wouldn't be home to eat the perfect meal. They were very young when they were married, and Jane uh, never quite got used to being a mother, I don't think, and never quite got used to the style of living that was required of the commissioner. My mother was not a very social person, and suddenly when they moved to New York, everything was social. Everything was going out to restaurants. Everything was people. And it was all his people and his job, and you either are a part of it or, you know, you're not. For lack of a better way of putting it, I think she was, you know, pretty reclusive. And I think it was a burden for Pete, and that nothing that he ever talked about. Privately, intimates speak of a deeper crisis. Jane suffered from debilitating alcoholism. I knew at some point that she had left. I can't tell you now when the hell that was. I don't know because the life didn't change. He had to set up the life for Ann, period. And that had been going on for a long time. I know that uh, they had problems and they were eventually divorced. And those were down days for Pete very dark. From the time Anne Marie was a young child, Roselle raised her by himself. Later, he was granted custody. Most homes, you know, there's a dining room and a no TV rule and, um, you know, dinner is a, a very kind of sacred time and for us it was the exact opposite. Dinner had to be on TV trays, had to be in front of the television. There was no conversation during dinner. And unfortunately, many of the Irish housekeepers that we had who were sweet and wonderful were not great cooks. And so dad would spend the commercial time teaching me how to hide food. She was very, very important to his life. I have seen him in situations where it would demand that his attention be taken totally by somebody else or something else, another event. But his concern was, first of all, for her. As an eligible bachelor, Roselle threw swinging summertime parties at a beach house on Long Island. He also unwound with fishing trips to the Caribbean or a spontaneous jaunt to the Far East. I wouldn't say we had a good time, but we didn't sleep for two weeks. We came back on the stretcher, both of us. An active dating life with such high-profile women as model Lauren Hutton and actress Carolyn McWilliams ended in 1973 when he met Carrie Cook the former daughter-in-law of Redskins owner, Jack Kent Cook. She brought life into him. You could tell that he was just deadly in love with her. They were like a couple of college kids who were dating. There would be spontaneously flowers at the house from Pete for her, you know, not on a daily basis, but a couple of times a week. They married in 1974, and with their combined family of five children, moved to Harrison, New York a chauffeur-driven ride to his NFL empire on Park Avenue. He was presiding over the most popular and the most lucrative sports league in the history of the world. Peter Supreme he is the great commissioner. He is the most important single administrative figure in the American sports scene. What are the next 10 years going to be like? Will it be more quiet, uh, less moving around, shifting the franchises? I sure hope so. We haven't had shift the franchises in football. We've been lucky. We've been, we had 41 franchises full before we started getting stability in the, in the 50s. And uh, I'm looking for, you know, a period of tranquility and some peace. The commissioner's hopes would not be realized. He was about to enter a decade of discord that would challenge his integrity and threaten the solid foundation that he had built for the NFL. As you can see, the terms are good. The rate is low. There are no points. But... Yes? 
Can't you come down a little? Fans, coach, and players said a downtrodden Dominic Hasek, it's really a shame. As you may have noticed, we went nuts in 1999 with interactivity. The computer-using ESPN follower gained more power than ever before, helping pick Sports Center showcases, giving opinion, and in this case, helping select the fifth best game. One day soon, they'll just do away with us, and you'll call the highlight. Hey, of the games nominated for the best from the NFL, the majority chose the 49ers over the Packers in that NFC wildcard game. Actually, it's more of a plurality, not a majority. Anyway, we're compliant. Here's that game. Charles Haley getting all set for battle. He's huge, and so is Reggie White playing in what might be his last game. First quarter, third and three, Steve Young avoiding. And then he goes to Terrell Owens. Darren Sharper's after him, knocked it loose. Packers have the football. Fourth and one, end of the first quarter. Packers down 7-3. Dorsey Levin had 27 carries for a buck 16. He's all the way to the two here. Beginning of the second, reversing the other way. Brett Favre, 20 to 35. Antonio Freeman back of the end zone. The pack up 10 to 7. 37 seconds left in the half. First to go for the pack. Levin through the dog pile and on in. It's 17-10 the Packers. Third quarter now. Second and 21. Favre throwing. Hand up. Picked off. Lee Woodall. Woodall going the other way with it. Has a large neck brace. Check out what happens, though. Favre and Gabe Wilkins going at it. Come on, we're all mammals. Finally, the two are separated. Favre gets into it like that. Steve Young looking for Owens. Should have it. Boat! His hands replaced by paddles before the game. Same drive, third and seven. Young, the fake. Oh, that is fancy. Greg Clark, he's open, and the game is tied at 17 apiece. Now 6-10 left, first and 10. Favre throwing, share. Darnell Walker picks it off. Brett not happy. Wilkins should have been back there, so he could have had somebody to punch. Four and a half to go, Niners ball, third and 10, up three, radio call. Goes to the sideline, Owens drops another one. What in heaven's name is going on with Terrell Owens today? I uh, let the team down a pivotal third down play where we could have milked the clock and uh, it would have took him out of the game, period. But I, I let him down on that play. Let him down, but he get another chance. Packers ball, fourth and one. Levens struggling, gets the first down. Same drive, first and ten, three minutes to go. 3.06 precisely. Favre launching it. Corey Bradford. Making the play, good play in the ball to the 30. Two minutes left, Favre pumping, lofting. It's Freeman. He's got a touchdown. The Packers are up by four. Under two to go. It's plenty of time. Plenty of time. And I also know that I got big receivers that I, if I get close to the end zone, we're going to have a shot. Um, and uh, I think it's important when you have that much time in your timeouts that you don't get too greedy. Second and one, a minute six to go. Young working the field. Has to push himself out of the pocket. He finds Mark Edwards. Weebles wobble, but they won't fall down. He gets the gain for the 49ers. Now second and 10, 45 seconds to go. Young to Jerry Rice. Hadn't caught a ball all day. Catches this. This is consequential afterward. Lost the ball. Should have been Packers ball. 49ers keep it. Nova Scotian women, 18 to 26. Like Favre, feel it should have been Green Bay's. You know, if you physically got beat and they outplayed you, you know, that's just the way it goes. But if a play... Uh, like that cost you a game. Um, that, that would really be sad. The refs took the ball away from Green Bay. This time, Green Bay could have taken the ball. Instead, Craig Newsom on the pick. He dropped the football. Third and three. Niners with one last chance. Radio call. Young almost falls down. Throws to the end zone. Owens! 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 Caught it! He caught it! He caught it! He caught it! I was so happy for him because he had, you know, he had a couple of plays where he'd like to have back. And, um, and, and then he made the play to win the game for us. And, and, yeah, Steve threw it in there, and we protected and all of that. But, boy, he made a great play. All that emotion, and then the Niners would go on to lose to Atlanta in the next round of the playoffs. The call that negated the Rice fumble was one of the many curious decisions during the season that had owners approving a replay system for review of calls this season. Please stay around. Our countdown continues. For number four, we focus on the final four, Duke and UConn, and heavy drama. You know what, Kenny? Even before that game, which was awesome, the West.